Welcome to the BOTUS podcast. I am Jacek from BOTUS and today I am bringing to you a very special guest. Her name is Dr. Martina Stefanini and she comes from the University of Bologna in Italy. Um, she is a periodontist, but she also works together uh, in the research group of Professor Giovanni Zucchelli in Bologna. So we are really very happy to have her here. Martina Stefanini will be today um, interviewed by my colleague, Dr. Arturo Robertazzi. So I am now handing over the word to my colleague, Arturo. So thank you, Jacek, uh, for the kind introduction and welcome Martina to the Botis podcast. So um, for the listeners, um, Martina uh, Stefanini uh, is uh, graduated from the University of Bologna and from the same university, uh, she received a PhD in medical sciences and uh, she's been working a lot uh, in research within the group of uh, Giovanni Zucchelli at the University of Bologna. So it's really a pleasure to have you here. Um, I mean, you were... Um, your work at the University of Bologna is probably the most interesting uh, part, but it's, you also work in a private practice, Martina, right? Yes, I share my uh, private practice with my family. And let's say my daily routine is in the morning, I spend my time at the university uh, doing, doing researches and also treating patients because we have in our uh, dental clinic, we have a periodontal department uh, and we are obviously specialized in soft tissue management around teeth and implant. And in this department, we treat our patient and we perform our clinical trials. And this is the morning side of Martina's life. In the afternoon, uh, I share my private practice with my families, in particular with my father and with my uncle. And I'm basically uh, periodontist, 90% and 10% uh, implantologist. So this is my, uh, my daily routine. <laughs> And uh, so cool. I mean, um, at the University of Bologna, I suppose you have several uh, research lines. Can you comment a bit about, about that? Yes, our main research focus at the moment is regarding biomaterial. Especially we are working a lot on the um, connective tissue substitutes in both periodontal and implant field. Uh, as you know, our uh, surgical specialty is regarding the soft tissue management and in this uh, way we would like to find the, the best substitute for the connective tissue graph in order to reduce patient morbidity. So we are trying to focus our research, especially our clinical trial, uh, on using this new biomaterial, both around teeth but also around implant. And also working on biomaterials, we are uh, using also some bone substitute uh, in the um, implant placement. Uh, because, you know, for us, soft tissues set the tone, but also the bone play an important role in this field. Uh, so especially in immediate implant placement, uh, in order to fill the gap, we are trying to use different biomaterial uh, associated also with connective tissue substitute in order to obtain as much as possible in only one surgical procedure the best possible result in terms of hard and soft tissues. These are mainly our uh, research topics at the moment in our department. Okay, so um, going back a little to the uh, uh, soft tissue management, you mentioned that you're working a lot on uh, biomaterials and uh, connective tissue. So one question could be, what are you looking exactly in a biomaterial um, to replace or be or substitute the autologous uh, tissue? So let's back to the characteristic of the connective tissue graph. The main important characteristics of the connective tissue graph deriving from the palate of our patient are mainly true. The connective tissue graph help the flap to remain stable in the final coronal position when the flap is not stable by itself. This is one of the most important aspects. The second important aspect is that when we use the connective tissue graph is because we want to change the patient phenotype, the soft tissue phenotype of our patient, because a thin phenotype is a 
fa- is a risk factor for gingival recession recurrence. So when you treat a gingival recession and you don't want the patient will experience this problem again, you have to change the thickness of the soft tissue. So these are the two aspects that we would like to have exactly in the same way in a connective tissue substitute. And I think that regarding the increase in soft tissue thickness, we have, for example, with the mucoderm, reached a very high level in terms of increasing soft tissue thickness because this material is able to incorporate the blood clot that will become with time connective tissue graph. So it works like a connective tissue graph, but it takes time to achieve the same goal. Uh, regarding the flap stability, we are still um, doing, conducting some researches because this is a characteristic which is very difficult to reproduce in a biomaterial. And so we are working on it to improve the quality of the material that we have now available. But basically, so basically, these are the two aspects. Yes, increase in soft tissue thickness and add the flap stability in the coronal position. And the, um, regarding the thickness, um, how much would you say is necessary to increase when using a uh, soft tissue uh, subsi- substitute like mucoderm or the CTG? When you are treating teeth, it's different with respect to when you are treating implant. Because when you are treating implant and when you need to increase soft tissue thickness around implant, you need at least two millimeters increase of soft tissue thickness because the supracrestal soft tissues around implant are not attached to the implant thread like around teeth where the soft tissues are strongly attached to the root. So when you speak about implant, you need at least two millimeter of thickness. Why you need less thickness when you speak about teeth. Let's say 1.5 millimeter is more than enough. Going back maybe to uh, you know, the initial question, the question could be why do we need a substitute? I mean, uh, why are you looking for a biomaterial that they can mimic the uh, properties of uh, the autologous tissue? What is the problem with uh, that? Why do you want to solve this problem? The problem, mainly the problems are two. One problem is related to the morbidity of the patient because obviously when you need to harvest a connective tissue from the palate, you have two surgical sites. This increase the risk of complication, increase the morbidity, increase the uh, post-operative um, risk for your patient. And on the other side, the availability of the palate is limited to the amount of the palate of the patient. So if you have to treat only one single recession defect, it's not a problem. But when you have a patient affected by multiple gingival recession in four quadrants, you cannot uh, use the palate from your patient. So you need an alternative material to substitute the connective tissue. And then staying with the recession coverage, um Do you think you found this material? I think yes. Uh, I think yes. There is, uh, we have, I have a lot of experience in the use of mucoderm around teeth and I'm really happy with the result that I was able to obtain. And for sure, in the upper jaw, uh, we were able to solve every kind of defects. The only area in which we, cannot use the um, substitute material in, is when you are treating the lower incisor. In this specific area, we still have some limit that I'm pretty sure that with time, with time we will overcome. Um, and what is uh, the problem with the lower jaw then? Why, why is more difficult? The problem of the lower jaw is related to the specific anatomy of this area. In this area, most of the time, you have a very shallow vestibule depth, a lot of muscles, frenula. And in this area, you need to have the connective tissue wrap that act as a barrier to prevent the early muscles reinsertion. So the, the collagen substitutes still don't have this capability to uh, delay the muscle's reinsertion in this area. It's related to the really 
peculiar and difficult uh, anatomy of this specific area. But I think that with time, we will also try to solve this problem. You're optimistic. Um, let's say that we are in the upper jaw. Can you, uh, in simple words, because we don't have the visual aid, walk us through what you do from opening the package of, uh, for example, mucoderm to the uh, actual surgery in a multiple recession, for example? It's when I have to treat multiple recession, I never use either the connective tissue graft or the collagen mattering for the treatment of all included teeth. It's completely different. The coronally advanced flap with the tunnel technique, for example, from this point of view, because when you perform a tunnel technique, you have to use the connective tissue graft or the collagen matrix for the treat of all included teeth. While when you perform a coronally advanced flap, you can use the connective tissue graft or the biomaterial cytospecifically in a cytospecific mm. way. So before the surgery, I always evaluate carefully every included tooth and I decided in which one I will need to apply biomaterial or a connective tissue graft. So before using the blade, I already know how many connective tissue graft I will need or how many uh, pieces of collagen matrix I will fix. Because otherwise, if I will use too much material, I will risk to, um, let's say, damage or to impair the vascular supply from, my, from the flap. And mm. um, so basically, I put the collagen matrix into the saline at the beginning of the surgery because I really like to work with the collagen matrix, which is already wet and ready to be used. And it takes at least 20 minutes, but if it's also half an hour, uh, it's perfect. And usually I like to add thickness, especially in those elements which are buccally displaced or which present a root concavity in order to avoid the flap to collapse inside mm -hmm. this concavity, or in the elements uh, in which the keratinized tissue is lacking. So if I have less than one millimeters of keratinized tissue in my flap, I always apply the collagen matrix. So basically, the indication for the use of the collagen matrix when you are treating gingival recession is when you have buccally displaced root, root concavities, and lack of keratinized tissue. And uh, I mean, you performed a lot of surgeries with uh, mucoderm. Uh, what is the long-term uh, uh, result? Are you satisfied by the long-term result in recession coverage using mucoderm? Yes, absolutely. You know that after six months, the, the mucoderm is completely degraded. So the result that you evaluate at six months after surgery is the true connective tissue formation. So it's the true final result. And usually at six months, I always experience very nice result that then will be maintained over time if the patient obviously will follow us and will not start again to brush atraumatically. And usually we have very nice results and you know, I'm very young, so I don't have very long term <laughs> results, but we have cases with more than five years of follow up showing the stability of the result obtained at six months. So we are very satisfied. Yeah, that very good. I mean, um, recession coverage is, um, we've seen a lot of uh, evidence for mucoderm and a lot of clinical evidence also from, uh, from your group. I suppose by adding an implant and so trying to increase the soft tissue around an implant, we are increasing also the difficulty of the whole uh, uh, procedure. So what is the situation with that? What, what do you do when uh, there's a deficiency around an implant? What is your uh, workflow? When there is a, de uh, a buccal lingual deficiencies around implant, meaning there is a lack of soft tissue thickness around an implant already placed, uh, I have a lot of experience with the mucoderm, and we have uh, also published a case series studies on that, in which we were able to demonstrate that it's possible to obtain an increase in soft tissue thickness 
up to two millimeters, which is a successful result from all points of view. Uh, in all the included cases in our case report, uh, the gingival margin was already in the ideal position. So we don't, we didn't include patient with an apical coronal soft tissue deficiencies because in these cases we are starting now to working on the use of substitute material but we still don't have an evidence on that why mm -hmm. if you have to increase the soft tissue thickness which is lacking in an implant already placed with the soft with the gingival margin already in the ideal position i can recommend the use of the mucoderm instead of a connective tissue graft always with the idea to reduce as much as possible the morbidity for the patient. And um, in this case, how do you use mucoderm and uh, do you mix it with amelogenins also? Uh, the main indication, in uh, my opinion, to mix mucoderm with endogen is in the treatment of infrabony defects for periodontal reason. This is another important topic. So, and I have some very nice results in the treatment of deep infrabony defect in the aesthetic area. So you can say teeth with a noble pro uh, hopeless prognosis treated with a um, periodontal regenerative technique that combine a coronary advanced flap. And under this coronary advanced flap, I place the mucoder that act as a wall to um, avoid the risk of flap collapse inside the infrabony component because in most of these defects we have the lack of the buccal bony wall so in order to keep the blood clot stable inside the infrabony component and avoid the flap collapse the mucoderm fixed at the papilla anatomical disepitalized papilla of the adjacent lc tooth uh, it's something that is able to turn a non contenitive defect in a contenitive defect, in which I simply apply a melogenin and I really uh, obtain very, very nice results in terms of clinical attachment level gain, radiographic bone defect feel, and aesthetic outcome. This is, for me, uh, one of the most promising indications for the um, use of mucoderm and a melogenin. But of course, there are some cases in which, unfortunately, you cannot save the tooth. So in that situation, you have to extract the tooth. And what would be that your procedure there? I mean, uh, you're removing a tooth and then what happens? Um, when I remove a tooth, <laughs> it's such a large question. <laughs> yeah. It depends. But if we are always speaking of the aesthetic area, because I like to speak of aesthetic area because it's more challenging because you need to obtain an aesthetic result. When you are speaking about posterior area, you need to provide your patient function. When you speak about anterior area, you need obviously function, but also aesthetics. And when I speak about aesthetics and I have to extract a tooth, if it is possible for me, uh, the best solution for the patient is to provide immediate implant placement uh, in order to reduce the number of surgical procedures. And obviously, if I perform an immediate implant placement, I want to elevate the flap because I want to extract as much as possible in a, a traumatically way uh, the hopeless tooth. Then I place my implant with a guided implant procedure. And if there is a uh, buccal bone deficiencies, I place some biomaterial, let's say I place some cerebon in the uh, implant thread that are exposed from the buccal mm -hmm. bone. And I place the bone in this area, which correspond to the exposed implant thread, because then there is the area from the implant edge to the gingival margin that is the area for the soft tissues. So in this area, I place a connective tissue graph in order to increase the soft tissue thickness. And obviously in cases of very deep buccal bone deficiencies, 
I also like to add between the connective tissue and the cerebellum a Jason matrix in order to protect the biomaterial and to obtain better stability of the material above the exposed implant threads. Then I completely coronally advance the flap and I um, apply also a provisional restoration that will help me to stabilize the flap around the uh, abutment and the provisional crown. So usually this is my first choice. Uh, always, I need always to plan the case on uh, the CBCT uh, because I want to be sure to place the implant in the right way to obtain primary stability for the immediate provisionalization, obviously. So basically, when you have a small defect, you will just place the cerebellum, for example, and cover it with a CTG, and then that's it. If you have a larger defect, you will, you will also use a membrane. So what is the advantage of using JSON membrane there, and why do you need it in these cases? You need it to stabilize the bone graft in this huge defect. And since it's very easy to fix and very, very easy to handle this uh, matrix uh, can be fixed at the periosteum lateral to the buccal bone defect in order to stabilize the, the particle of the biomaterial that are placed above the exposed thread of the implant. And it will act, let's say, like a matrix that, uh, let's say, protects the particle of the, the cerebellum and then I can place my connective tissue graph attached to the inner aspect of the flap. Okay, so I think we covered a lot of topics from recession coverage to uh, bone regeneration and period effects. So I would like to thank you, Martina, for your time. Thank you really uh, for your time with, uh, with us, with Botis. And, um, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to discuss with you about our uh, surgical procedure and our use of biomaterial because you know, it's our research topics and we need to improve and to try and to make the more possible experience on that. So thank you. And I hope, I hope to see you soon around somewhere in the world. So thank you, Martina. Thank you. Bye.